bring a message entitled Worthy and ask you the question to consider with me, are you worthy to escape the things that are coming up in this earth and are you worthy to stand before the Son of Man? Jesus said when he went away, he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He said, ye believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. May our faith in Jesus Christ alone grow in these days. As I'm in Genesis chapter 18, I'm working out of the, uh, I'm sorry to say it, I'm back to the King James again this morning for some reason. I've been trying to transition it to the New American Standard, but I keep coming back to this anchor. I've been a Christian now for uh, 62 years, been preaching for 49, and I'm so logged into the King James that when I go to my study and I have six, seven, eight Bibles laid out, I always seem to pick up the King James. And uh, I'm back on it again this morning. Please forgive me for those of you who love the NAS, New American Standard. I haven't forgotten it. I'll get back to it. I'm in Genesis chapter 18. I'm going to begin to read at verse 16. Follow me along in your Bible or the one provided for you under your seat. Did you know that this year is the year of the Reformation? Yes. The great Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, 500 years ago, opened up the scriptures. And he began to teach sola fide, yeah. by faith alone. Through sola gratia, by grace alone. Through sola scriptura, through the scriptures alone. Through sola Jesus Christos through Jesus Christ alone, and by sola di gloria, for the glory of God alone, we come to salvation, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his grace. And as you hear the message this morning, I want you to understand the purity of the gospel comes because we stick to the word. That's why I'm under a plumb line as I stand in this pulpit this morning. It is the plumb line of the word. This is the rule of faith, what we believe, this is the rule of conduct, how we live our life. So listen again as I start. And the men rose from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham may surely come a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be a blessing in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood for the Lord. And Abraham near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Would you also not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are in it? Thank you. That be far from thee to do after the manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. For adventure there shall lack five of the 50 righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And God said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure, there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure, there shall be thirty found. He said, I will not do it 
if I find 30 there. He said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, peradventure that there shall be 20 found there. He said, I will not destroy it for 20's sake. And he said, oh, let me not, let the Lord not be angry. I will speak yet, but this one peradventure, 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. I apologize for this mic because it gets a spitting sound. Now, I'm not really spitting. I'm really not. It's the mic. But something's wrong with my ear mic, and I don't know what it is. I prefer it a lot. There, there was a day when the cry, the noise from Sodom and Gomorrah reached the ear of God in heaven, and he responded. It was the sound of wickedness. And in verse 20, it says, God said the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great because their sin is very grievous. So, verse 21, he came down to see what was going on. Now, this was an Old Testament theophany. A theophany was an Old Testament appearance of Jesus before he was born in the manger, before his incarnation. And he came on several occasions and spoke to people looking like an angel, but he was the son of God. He did that with Enoch in Genesis 5 and to Noah in Genesis 6, to Moses in Exodus 33, where the Bible says he spoke face to face with God. He, he did it with Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. He did it many, many times in scripture. This one that I'm reading to you this morning is one of the clearest presentations of a theophany. Old Testament appearance of Christ before he came in the flesh as a man. After his incarnation, when he was born of the Virgin Mary and came forth as a babe in the manger, there was never a theophany after that because he had now come in the flesh. But these Old Testament appearances of Christ bring with them incredible revelation of the character and nature of God. So he came to Abraham's campsite with two other angels. The Bible says these three men came walking across the plain and there was Abraham's campsite on, on the top of the hill looking over the plain of Mamre and looking down on Sodom and Gomorrah from a great distance. And as he came, Adam prepared, or Abraham prepared for him uh, all of the hospitality that was normal for those eastern countries, and they ate together. But the Bible says the two angels that came with the Theophany, came with Jesus, they went ahead to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they left Abraham and Jesus standing together. Now, God decides, and we read it there in verse 17, to tell Abraham why he was there. He had come to destroy those cities because of their great sin. And he brought two angels with him to do the work. You think, do angels really have the power to destroy cities? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, we are coming in this prophetic hour into a time of great angelic increase in activity. It's happening all over the world. Angels are becoming more and more involved with us. And they will. Now, we don't worship angels. We worship God. But angels are very active. There are angels in this sanctuary today. You can't see them, but they're here. I have two that always stand with me while I'm preaching, no matter where I am in the world. Those two go with me, and they stand. One is tall, about seven foot. The other is a little one, about five foot. They always stand to my right. I have had so many people come to me and say, Pastor, did you know you had two angels standing with you today? I say, yes, I know. They're there all the time. They don't let me see them, but I know they're there. I can feel their presence at times. And the increase of angelic activity in the earth is really coming on strong in these days. So angels are very important. The Bible says they are ministering spirits for the heirs of salvation. They are there for the help of the saints. And at times, angels have prevented things in our lives that we're not even aware of. But they're there all the time. The Bible says when we're born, God gives one or two angels to every human being who's ever born. Every newborn baby has their own guardian angels. I remember when my father-in-law, Walter, Diane's dad, was dying in Mather Hospital. We stood at his bed, and he said to me, David, who are those two men standing at the bottom of my bed? And I said to him, I believe they're the angels that have come to take you home. And he went, oh. And with that, he was gone. They took him home, peacefully and quietly, took him home. I remember when my mother died. And she took her last breath, and a little Irish nurse was there in the room with us. 
And she said, I must open the window and let her spirit out. I said, dear, dear, don't bother yourself. Your spirit already went and the window didn't have to be open. The spirit went. But we were aware of angelic presence in the room with my mom when she was passing. And so angels are all around. Say, so Jesus brings these two angels with him. And uh, we know from Second Chronicles 32, verse 21, that one angel in that passage killed 185,000 uh, troops in the battle that Syria had set against, us Syria had set against Israel. And that night when they all went to bed, 185,000 troops were killed in a stealth-like manner. Nobody even knew that it happened. But the next morning when the morning woke, when the, the uh, king woke up, and you could check me out in the Bible, the Bible says all 185,000 troops of his army were dead. One angel came in in the night and nobody even knew he was there. They slept right through it, but the work was done. So yes, angels had the ability to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and in fact, they did. Now, Abraham, in this passage, begins to pray, uh, to intercede and to plead with God for mercy for the righteous people who he thought were living in that vile, ungodly, and immoral environment. And so he asks the Lord a series of six times, will you spare the people? Will you spare the people if you find righteous here? He asks the Lord, will you deal with the righteous the way you deal with the unrighteous? Of course, we know that God doesn't deal with the unrighteous in the same manner. So consider another passage with me uh, as I speed along with you, coming to Luke chapter 21. I want to read some verses of scripture there to you because it is a passage that, that blends very well and really uh, explains what we're reading in Genesis chapter 18. I mean, Luke chapter 21, verse 34. You need to know these verses. You need to be aware that they're in your Bible. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with surfeiting, that's overeating, and drunkenness, that's intoxication, and the cares of this life, that's worry about everything. And that day come upon you unaware, for as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the earth, on the whole face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. It is in this passage that we find out something about righteousness. Remember now, Adam is back here uh, praying for God to spare the righteous. And here Jesus says to us through Luke, pray that you'll be worthy to escape the judgments that are going to come up on the whole world because of sin and wickedness. Luke writes, stay awake and watch at all times. Be discreet and attentive and ready. Ready for what you say? Ready for the coming of the Lord. I said to you a few moments ago, he said, I'm coming again. And he is. His coming is closer now than it has ever been. And he said when he came, we need to be watching for him. So we're, we're to be ready. The admonition of Luke here in the 18th chapter is that we would be ready to escape the judgments that are coming. I believe America is in the very, very early days of judgment. I believe the hurricanes that came were a form of judgment. There are other judgments that will come in the days that are ahead because America has turned away from God. We've become a sinful and decadent nation that has no room or time for God. We've kicked them out of our schools. We've cut prayer out. We've cut everything out. We've said, God, we don't want you in our culture, in our society. And there's a rising tide of persecution against Christians in this country. We need to be aware that the days are not always favorable for Christians worldwide. And it is true here in America. Things are changing in our culture, changing in our society. And a tolerance for Jesus Christ is at an ebb tide flow. And so we need to be aware that perilous times are coming. But we need to understand what God was looking for when he came there in the 18th chapter. Come on back there with me uh, for a moment, back to the 18th chapter of Genesis. Abraham cries out to God, Will you be merciful and spare the righteous? Here in Luke, he says, pray that you be counted worthy to escape. What is it that makes us worthy? It is righteousness. What is it that makes us prepared to be a holy people? For in Hebrews, it says, be holy as I am holy. For without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. But holiness comes out of righteousness. And so here, uh, Adam, Abraham rather, is praying for God to spare the righteous. 
And over here we find out what is the qualifier to be worthy to escape what's coming on the earth. What is it that will qualify you and I to stand one day before the Lord Jesus Christ? It will be righteousness. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness which we receive by faith from Jesus Christ. So as, as we look back in this passage of scripture, uh, we, we find out what it means to be worthy. It means to have righteousness active in your life. Come back with me to Genesis 18 now, where Abraham cries out to God to be merciful and spare the righteous who are living in the city. So when he came to examine Sodom and Gomorrah, what was the Lord looking for? It doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure it out, does it? He was looking for righteousness. Abraham understood it. He began to cry out for the righteous. And as he cries, the number gets lower and lower. And finally, Abraham makes a mistake. He quits at 10. He should have kept right on praying because really there was only one righteous in the city. That was Lot. But he, he stopped praying. And the Bible says in the last verse of that chapter that the Lord left him at that point. He stopped interceding. May I encourage you to never stop praying for the lost. Never stop praying for unsaved loved ones in your family. They may be way away. They may be alienated. They may no longer be a part of the normal gatherings of your family. And they're missing. Pray for them. Don't ever give up on a child of God. And don't give up on anybody who's still breathing. We need to be praying for the lost. So what was the Lord looking for? In the middle of all of the sin and filth that he saw in Sodom and Gomorrah, he was looking for righteousness. There was a lot of sin there deserving of his judgment, and there was great cause for why he would destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But it makes me think that what makes us worthy to escape judgment is righteousness. I don't want to be here when, right, when judgment comes. I don't want to be here when everything breaks out that the Bible says is coming. I'm looking for the upper taker. I'm looking for Jesus. I want to go to heaven to be with him, don't you? I'm looking forward to the rapture. But there were no righteous souls in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, sins they abounded in every manner, shape, and form. But there was really only one there who even marginally, partially adjusted for righteousness, and that was Lot. So God spares Lot. His wife, and you know what happened to her. She left Sodom and Gomorrah. She didn't really want to leave with Lot. She still loved Sodom, and she kept looking back, wanting to go back to that lifestyle, wanting to be there. And the Bible says she was turned to a pillar of salt. As those cities were burning and the ash was coming down, her body literally turned to salt. Her name's not even mentioned in the scripture. Enough is there for us to get the picture. Judgment came on her when she had the opportunity to go with righteousness, and she turned back to sin. She suffered judgment. Well, God brought him, Lot, his wife, and their two daughters out of the city. And the angel said something very interesting. If you look in Genesis, the 19th chapter, come over there with me uh, quickly this morning. In Genesis, the 19th chapter, and come with me to verse 13. Something very interesting here. The angels are speaking to them to bring them out of the place. Lot, his wife, and the two girls. And he says, we will destroy this place because of the cry of them is waxed great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed to be as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, when the angels hastened Lot, he said, arise and take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, that you not be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hands of his two daughters. And the Lord, being merciful unto him, brought them forth and set them outside the city. And he says to them in verse 22, escape, run, get out of here, because we cannot do anything to the city while you are still here. That says something to me about the rapture. The full judgments of God that are mentioned in the book of Revelation cannot come until the church is taken out. You and I will be spared that through the rapture, through our gathering unto Christ, and he's coming back for his church. Could be any time now. All Bible prophecies that I'm aware of to be fulfilled before he returns have been fulfilled. And there's nothing that can prevent Jesus from coming back again for you and I. He could come in the daytime. He could come at night. We don't know when he's coming. We don't know the day or the hour. But all he said was be ready. Watch and live a holy and chaste life. 
that God might have you ready when he comes. So what is righteousness? It is morality. It is godliness. It is holiness. It is clean and upright living as Jesus taught us. Billy Graham has a favorite verse of scripture. And the scripture he calls his life verse is Galatians 6, 14. He's about 98, 99 years old now. And the prophets are saying when Billy Graham goes home, we're going to be going right behind him. Well, he's 98, 99 now. So I think the coming of the Lord is pretty close. But this is the verse, Galatians 6, 14. Billy Graham adapted as a life verse. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, Franklin Graham, his son, says this. My father has this Bible verse pinned up all over the house. He has it in his bedroom where he can read it from his bed. It's in large print. He says he has it in the bathroom. He has it in the dining room. He has it in the garage. He has it on the dash of the car when I take him for rides. All over the house, Billy Graham has put that verse, Galatians 6, 14. He said, my dad saturates his mind and his heart with that verse. And recently, on his 98th birthday, can you imagine, Billy Graham was still preparing sermons. And he sat down to prepare a sermon, and he brought it together with Philippians chapter 3 as the text. And that dovetails with Galatians 6. If you just turn there with me for a moment, let's look at that other passage real quick. In Philipp, uh, Philippians chapter 3, when you come, I, I use my Bible a lot, so please uh, bear with me as I share with you the Word of God this morning. The most important thing you'll hear today, more important than hearing who won the, the uh, World Series, is to hear what God is saying to you and to your generation. Listen to Philippians chapter 3. These were the verses that Billy Graham chose to put with his life verse. Verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he must trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But those things which were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Did you hear that? Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, the kind of righteousness that comes from us doing good deeds, from giving and being nice to people and helping dogs when they need rescue, and all those things that people do that are good works, they don't make us righteous. He says, but that righteousness, which is the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So he takes those verses and put them together with Galatians preparing a sermon and has asked God to give him enough strength to preach it. So at 98, 99, he's ready to go home, but he hasn't quit reading his Bible, hasn't quit serving the Lord, hasn't quit praying, still preparing sermons that he may never deliver, but still staying on the cutting edge of what called, God called him to be. Those things, he said, were not the source of my righteousness, but my righteousness comes by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the sola fidea. That's the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ that Martin Luther so embraced. Uh, we should never boast about our own righteousness because of who we are or what we have done. We should not boast in our good works. Our, our boasting and our mindset must be based on God's righteousness, who is Jesus and what he has done for us. My righteousness comes as a gift from the Lord Jesus Christ. When I stand before the Lord and I believe his righteousness will be enough for me to stand before the Lord on that day. I believe it'll make me worthy to escape what's coming upon the earth. Righteousness. You want to embrace righteousness. And when we turn to Jesus with all our hearts and forsake our sins to serve him as our Lord and worship him as our God, he imputes righteousness to us. He credits it to our account. 
And the Bible says we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So by putting your faith in Christ, he gives to you righteousness that you might be found worthy to escape what's coming and just stand before the Lord. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 4. Look at these few verses with me rather quickly. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. What shall we say then, that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So Abraham learned that righteousness comes from God, and it is that righteousness that makes us worthy to escape judgment and makes us worthy to one day stand before the Lord. In James chapter 2, the Bible says Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. It's repeated several times in the scriptures that we might get it, not miss it. And he was called the friend of God. So pray that you will be accounted worthy to escape what's coming by way of judgments and to stand before the Son of Man. You know, things are changing in our world very rapidly. Right now, China and Russia and Iran and North Korea are moving in concert as one to remove America from its place of world supremacy militarily and economically. And things are happening right now to try to destroy America. Did you know that right now, just this past week, Chinese jet fighters did bombing runs on Guam, which is an American territory. They did dry practice runs on bombing Guam. They are on the rise. It's called the dragon. The dragon is rising. And the dragon hates America and hates everything we stand for. And so we are in, in a battle locked with China. Right now our president is going there. But in fact, they are one of our greatest enemies. And he's trying to bring reconciliation. We need to pray for our president. God would give him wisdom. But these are tenuous times, troublous times. War is a possibility in the days that are ahead. Economic collapse is a possibility in the days ahead. We need to be so close to Jesus in these days that no matter what happens, we are safe and content and he'll take care of us. He'll always take care of the righteous. He'll always be feeding the righteous when others don't have food. We'll be able to feed them. Pray that you'll be accounted worthy to escape the coming judgments and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus said, to give you his righteousness is the desire of his heart. And I believe God's judgments are already beginning in our nation. There are yet more to come. And I believe it's a serious time for prayer. Serious time for you to be praying for your kids, your family, for yourself. Serious days that call for serious prayer. And as a return to righteous living, can I call you out of the shadows? Can I call you from playing games with sin, compromising your faith, playing around with temptations, flee temptation, flee sin, and cleave to righteousness? This is a day to be clean. This is a day to be clean. This is a day to put away everything perverse and everything ungodly and live a clean and virtuous life. It's time for us to raise our children to understand right from wrong and to help them to see the light that is in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot sin a little. We cannot compromise a little. We cannot play around with temptation. It will destroy us, but we need to run for righteousness. Not righteousness we earn by our good works, but the righteousness which is ours by faith in Christ. So Hebrews says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And holiness is produced by righteousness. So how can I describe righteousness? It is that gift that God gives to us through Jesus Christ that qualifies us to one day stand with him in his presence. Your righteousness and mine will never carry us into God's presence on that day. But the righteousness is, as Isaiah said, our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's the equivalent of a menstrual cloth or a greasy rag from the garage. Our righteousness looks like that to God. But the righteousness of Christ will carry us through. In Luke 21, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So be careful then of these three things that Jesus warned us about in Luke 21. He said, be careful about surfeiting, about excessive eating. Be careful about drunkenness getting into intoxication. Be careful about the cares of this world, for they will come as traps. 
and they will snare us and keep us from God's best. Instead, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, live a clean and holy life, put away sin, put away compromise, and live in the light as he is in the light. Be pure as he is pure. Be clean as he is clean. In all of your business relationships, be honest. Give a, works, a, works, a day's work for a day's pay. Don't try to steal and get away with it. It doesn't pay. We need to live righteous, tell the truth, live a holy life, and be ready when Jesus comes. Only he can make you and me righteous. That is, worthy to escape what's coming and worthy to stand before the Son of Man. I pray that God's word will find a place in your heart today and that you'll take it to heart seriously and say, God, make me like you. Make me like Jesus. I don't want to be like the world. I want to be like Jesus. That'll make you different. And the world will hate you, I assure you of that. But Jesus said, if they've hated me, they'll hate you. If they love me, they'll love you. So there is a price for us to pay for us to be a Christian today. And we will take some hits. Uh, Christianity is not a cakewalk. Christianity is a battle. We're constantly fighting three enemies, the world, our flesh, and the devil himself. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Father, we thank you today for the attentiveness of your people and for the grace that you gave me to stand to the pulpit once again this morning. Thank you for physical strength to stand here. Thank you for the grace to teach and preach your word again. Help those who've heard my faltering stance uh, be those who hear and understand your word. And they'll find root in our hearts today. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen and amen. Praise God.